absolutely uh, the number one. Uh, that's probably the biggest impact we can do. So that's one example where these silos really need to come together if we're going to take this further forward. John uh, got together about 40 people to come up with the challenges document. Levels of inflammatory proteins like TNF being really high that we would treat with medication. There was one well done study in Europe where they didn't just ask patients because it's difficult to say when you're stressed and when you're not, especially in hindsight. So there's solid biologic evidence that stress can uh, sort of get you closer to the threshold. A number of years ago, when, when, when Jonathan Braun was the, the, uh, the head of the NSAC, um, John uh, got together about 40 people to come up with the challenges document. And, and the challenges document was really what should the challenges be for the next five years or three to five years for the organization, and brought together um, certainly everybody on this panel as well as 35 other people to come up with what the most important priorities are. And, and in that document, and, and maybe some of you have seen it, it was published in the IBD journal a number of years ago, um, there really, uh, um, at the end of the day, there were about four priorities that, that rose, rose to the table, um, or rose to the top, I should say. <coughs> and, and the first priority is how we translate discovery to patients. And, and everybody here is either connected to the disease in some way, either as a patient or, or as a family um, a member of a patient or knows someone, obviously that's the most important thing. And so that was certainly was at, at the top. The other, which was something that we talked about earlier today, was really how do you predict how people are going to do? And predicting prognosis, you fi finding biomarkers or other markers that you can predict how someone is going to do. And so the first was translating uh, um, discoveries to patient care, and that is regarding patients. The second w w was um, identifying biomarkers or ways to see how people would do. And the third and fourth um, were really understanding the human microbiome was the third, and the fourth was understanding genetics. In genetics, and, and highlight briefly what the advances are, very briefly, in, in, in the microbiome, um, uh, before going on to some of the other issues that, that is in your paper. And so, um, uh, what is the promise of genetics? And, and one of the questions I think that um, I ask myself and everyone here asks is, does genetics matter at all? Clearly my answer is going to be yes, otherwise I'm wasting my time personally. But I think it's very, very important. And in fact, I think Balfour showed last night how important it is. Balfour was talking about our approach to IBD and saying that our therapies are really coming in at the bottom of the process. And Balfour urged us to look at the back at the source of the problem to try and understand this. Now, Balfour's source of the problem is the bacteria. I would argue that you have to go back one further step, and that's to the host genetics. So that's the, the, the individual, the human genetics. Um, and I'm not trying to downplay the role of bacteria because I think that's vitally important and I think the, the genetic advances that we've had have shown us how important bacteria are because of the nature of some of the genes. But I would say that this is probably the field that is moving the fastest in IBD, in IBD research. I'm, I grant you that I'm very biased in that, I'm very passionate about this, but I would argue with any of my colleagues here that we're moving at a great pace in discovering new genes. Several things happen within families. It's not only shared genes, but there are shared environments as well. So the maternal transfer of bacteria mm -hmm. certainly happens. Shared diet, shared viral uh, and other uh, bacterial uh, exposure. Uh, and that's why twin studies are so important because there you can compare environmental versus genetic with identical versus non -identical. This is a prime example where you've got um, people like myself working on the, on the human genetics and we need to be working very closely with people like Balfour 
on the bacterial genetics and seeing do the two, is there some relationship between the two, which I firmly believe, <coughs> which is why I was having a go at Balfour by saying we need to go one step back further than the bacteria because I think we, we need to put these two together very clearly to really understand what the relationship is going on here. And the same is not just to a bacteria, but other uh, environmental factors like smoking and so on. What's the interaction between smoking uh, and your genetics, um, both for ulcerative colitis and for Crohn's disease? So that's one example where these silos really need to come together if we're going to take this further forward. And, and I just want to answer John's other question, because I just <laughs> remembered it. Um, was, the, uh, was the question of how many genes any individual person might have. Um, we don't really know that, John, at the moment, um, and there's work looking at that. What we've got to remember, though, with some of these genetic changes that increase the risk of Crohn's disease is that they're relatively common within the population. And the, the extreme example of that is um, one called the IL-23 receptor. What it's called is completely irrelevant, um, I think, for this point. But 99% of people with Crohn's disease, the Caucasian population, that is, carry one of these uh, variants. But so do 93% of healthy controls. So it's, it, it it's again just shows you how complicated this is. We get a small increased risk uh, of developing the disease. But again, uh, it, it is not explaining all of the disease by any means. Yeah, the fourth challenge area that really rose to the top of the things that, that, that we needed to know to really understand inflammatory bowel disease. And the CCFA has made an incredible investment, and we heard a little bit um, from Balfour about this yesterday. Actually, we heard a lot about it from Balfour yesterday. Um, but what I thought we'd do just for a few minutes is, is um, let, let our panelists uh, um, highlight um, and, and perhaps some things that, that Balfour didn't touch on yesterday of what, we le what we've learned over the last couple of years about the human microbiome and th that also might um, uh, really pique our interest of what we really need to know in the future. We know that there's a genetic susceptibility and we know there's an environmental one. And, um, the question is, what's the nature of that environmental input, and how does it affect our body? We don't know the answer to that, although we do know it's very important, because even in identical twins, it's a 50% impact, or, um, or the risk has changed so much in the last generation. The uh, microbiome idea is that the environment that we're living in is, is affecting um, the organisms that live in our gut either because of the food that we eat, they eat what we eat, so if the bacteria change, then um, our, if our f diet changes, then our bacteria change. And then things like antibiotics, our habits of use of antibiotics have really changed and that will change our microbiota. We know in mice that they're very, that, that has a, the, the composition of your microbiota has a big effect on your uh, IBD susceptibility. And we also know, and I think much of the really landmark work has been done by Balfour, he had shown that in mice with a genetic susceptibility for IBD, if you have the mice bearing certain sorts of microbiota, they get sort of a, a Crohn's-like lesion. And if they have other types of microbiota in their gut, then they get a UC-type lesion. And if so they have no microbiota, they, they don't get any lesions. Then they're okay, right. So the big challenge now is to find out which bacteria are the ones that put you at risk or are beneficial to you. And it's likely that that's going to be linked to your genetics. So certain microbiota that are good are protective or neutral for one group of people by their certain genetics. People with different genetics, it'll just be quite different that, that they might be deleterious. So that's the challenge now to put the two together. What we've learned, as Balfour said, is that there's uh, thousands of different species of bacteria. We each probably, between one person and the next, there's only 5% of the bacteria which are, are shared from one person to the next. So 90, each one person, one to the next, maybe 95% of your bacteria are going to be distinct. So it makes it a very complex experimental situation to figure out which organisms are playing a role because we're so different from one person to the next. Do we know 
are, are our bacteria right. constant, or do they change from day to day? So we knew nothing about these bacteria a few years ago. We knew that there were a lot of them, and the more we looked at them, the more that they were, and the more complex that they were. And so uh, the CCFA realized about three years ago that if we didn't look to understand what the uh, what the nature of the, the ecology of the bacteria were in the gut. If we didn't get that foundational information, there was no way to rationally approach the disease problem. So it was just Ted's point. And so that was the purpose for our microbiome initiative. And we, we looked very hard to find people that could do the job and were willing to make the commitment to ask, answer that question. And that's where we got the answer that there were thousands, maybe 10,000 different species of bacteria, that most of us are different, but there's a core set of bacteria. Some <coughs> of them are what's shared more than the nature of the bacteria, the identity of the bacteria, or their function, and so on. That's given us foundational information, which now allows us to rationally design, for the first time, studies uh, to look into human about, uh, uh, to compare people with the disease and without. <laughs> <laughs>